invite you to rise for the proclamation of the gospel, which comes to us today from the 17th chapter of St. Luke. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back. Praising God in a loud voice, he threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? He Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. The gospel, the good news of the Lord. So as we dive into the scriptures again today, it would appear that there's a couple of words that came up in both the first reading and the gospel, which is what I want to spend some time with today. The first is something about being a foreigner, and in this case, a Samaritan. And the second has to do with leprosy. And I just want to address, first of all, this idea of leprosy. I don't know what image you get in your mind, but I would just like to point out that leprosy back in the time of Elisha and of Jesus was not Hansen's disease, not the disease we think of that creates digits to fall off and, and severe deformities. They used the word leprosy to describe anything that probably was like psoriasis or eczema, something that was flaky and skin that would peel off and it would leave some kind of a breach of the skin. And for the people of that day, this was a great concern to them because they were trying to be pure as the heavenly creator was pure. And so anything that would suggest impurity, like a breach of the, of the body or of the clothing or even of the walls of a building was called leprosy, something that would show weakness. And so... The result or the consequence of being discovered to have leprosy was that you were removed from the village. And for both Naaman and the ten that we hear about in our gospel today, it meant being removed from your family life, from your employment, from the ability to worship in community. It was a form of isolation. And if we go back to that first reading today from Second Kings, that, that story about Naaman, I, this is a fascinating story. This powerful man, Naaman, a, a war hero in Aram, which is modern-day Syria, they had recently conquered and taken over Israel. And he was lauded for this. But Naaman, because of his leprosy, because of this skin ailment that he had, suffered just like everyone else. He was isolated. He was cut off. He was removed from his service to the king. And this troubled him greatly. And so he goes to the king and he says, I've heard that there is a healer in Israel. And I would like a letter for permission to go to him and to ask for a favor. Even though they were their rulers, in a sense, that was still the, the policy of the day. And so it's interesting to think Naaman came to this message, came to this information through a young Israeli servant girl. The lowest of the low. His own prophets, his own healers could not solve his problem. And so he finally, after suffering for a while, listens to the word of the lowest person in his culture. She had no power, no authority, but she reveals something to him that sparks a bit of hope. And so he decides in his desperation to follow it. 
And he goes to Israel. And it's interesting, the letter that gets sent to the Israeli king, how does he respond to it? What the heck is this about? I'm no healer. I'm no, this, this guy, they're just trying to pick another fight with us. They're trying to take us over again and humiliate us. And Elisha, the prophet, gets wind of this. I mean, the king is so upset, he tears his garments. Fairly dramatic, isn't it? Until you think about what it takes or what it took to sew those tunics and to make those beautiful garments. And here he is crying out, tearing his clothes. And Elisha's like, whoa, settle down. King, let him know that I'm here. Don't forget about our God. There is power here. Invite him to come to me. And so what do we hear about Naaman in this story? Being the, the prestigious man that he is, comes to Israel and goes to Samaria where Elisha lives. But how does he arrive? With camels and a retinue and clothing and gold and silver. And what's he going to do? He's going to buy his healing. He's going to convince this God of Israel to heal him. And look at how Elisha responds to him. He's outside his, his dwelling, right? Does Elisha leave his house? No. He sends his servants to go out to Naaman. And what does he tell him? I'll go down to the river and wash seven times. Now, seven's that number that means as many times as it takes. The, pers- the perfect number. Go down and wash in the Jordan. This is the, the waters that feed the life of the people of Israel. And Naaman, being a, a warrior, being a, a strong and mighty man, he says, that's, that's dumb. I can wash in the rivers back in, his, in Syria. What are wrong with the rivers in Damascus? I'm not doing that. And what? His arrogance shows up. Why is the man sick? Because of his arrogance, because of his design on staying in control and telling people and God how this is going to go. And he's ready to turn back and go home. So the, that, that's it. the guy didn't even come out to look at me. He didn't even honor me. Does he know who I am? And he's ready to go back home. And his servants come to him again. The people lowest and low. Father Naaman, why wouldn't you just at least go do it? He asked you to do something simple. Oh, you'd be ready to jump off a mountain, wouldn't you? Because that would bring you acclaim and wonder. He's telling you to go do something very simple. Like what? You know, rubbing salve or ointment on your skin. Go into the river and do it. And he looks at the river. Oh, it looks just like the river's back home. What's the difference? It's the simple thing in his midst. So finally his servants convince him to go down and he, he goes in the water seven times. What that means is it was over a period of time and he's there and each time he goes in the water, what do you imagine he's thinking or saying? Why am I doing this? This is silly. Oh God, why am I here? All right, I'll do it. And over this period of time, he starts to notice his flesh changes. Why? Because just like any moving river, any moving water, it starts to wash away the dead stuff. And it starts to replace it with new. And over this period of time, he suddenly realizes that in fact, he has been healed. And what started his healing was the voice of the servant girl. And what's kept his healing going? This revelation that he is in the midst of a God who looks at him. Doing the simple, ordinary thing. He becomes whole again. And his heart is changed. And he finds himself praying to the God of Israel, saying, Oh, please, let this happen. And it does. And he goes back to Elisha and he says, I now understand the power of your God. I see that there is no God but the God of Israel. Now this is a Syrian war general. And he says, now what do I do? 
Well, okay, here's a gift, Elisha. And Elisha, and this is, that's where the story ends that we hear today. Here's a gift. Thank you for this healing. Gratitude flows from him towards Elisha as God. And Elisha responds, no, thank you. My God is not for sale. If you are thankful to your God, to our God, to our God of Israel, thank Him in your way, but do not give me things. Be in relationship with that God. And Naaman says to him in the rest of this chapter, I have to go back home. And you know what I have to do, Elisha. I have to serve my king. And my king worships Ramon. And when I go into the temple with him and he bows down before our God Ramon, I have to bow with him or it will cost me my head. But in my heart, I want to worship the God of Israel. Will your God curse me? Will your God forget me? Will your God turn his back on me? And Elisha smiles at him and says... Go in peace. Your faith will save you. Go in peace. And Elisha says, well then, can I take two donkey loads of dirt back with me so that I can build an altar at my, at my house? And when I bow down to God, I will bow on that dirt. And I will remember the God of Israel. That dirt will be sacrament for me. Because people will look at me and they will see me bowing to dirt. And they'll say, oh, it's just dirt like any of us. But in my heart, I will know this is the dirt of Israel. This is the dirt of Samaria. This is the dirt of the Jordan River. This is the dirt of the God of Israel. And I will be one with your God. With our God. And Elisha says, go. Go in peace and do as you say. This foreigner comes to God. And we hear that in our gospel story again today. Don't we? This story of the foreigner who shows us what it means to be grateful to God for healing in our lives. You know, Jesus, who in this story is on this road heading to Jerusalem from up in the Galilee. This is about a five-day walk on the road down along the Jordan River because Samaria was not a safe place for Jews. They had been enemies for hundreds of years. The Jews did not speak well of the Samaritans. They thought they were half-bloods. They thought they were impure. And Jesus, walking with his retinue down the road, decides to stop at a village up in the northeast between the Galilee and Samaria. And there's a village there, and he's going into the village, and who does he encounter? Ten lepers standing outside the village, separated from their normal life. And they've heard about this guy. They've heard about his healing. They've heard about his teaching. They know he's a powerful instrument of God. And they cry out to him, not only unclean, unclean, but they say, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. And Jesus does something that very few people would do, especially not healers who felt like they were being called upon to grant a favor just because they called him master if he responds to it he owes them something and jesus risks a part of himself i don't know if you pick this up it's very subtle but it's the hinge in the story he looks at them remember two weeks ago when we were talking about the rich man and lazarus what was the rich man's sin Every day he went outside his building. Did he see Lazarus laying out in front of his house? Did he look at him? Did he dignify him with even a glance? Did he acknowledge that he existed? No. And because of that, a chasm was formed and he found himself in torment. Jesus does the opposite when the lepers cry out to him. He looks at them. And that begins their healing. He does what many others did not do as they walked by them. He looks at them. And he, in confidence, says, Go, go. Walk to Jerusalem. Show yourself 
to the priests, knowing that on the way they would be cleansed. They would be healed. And you notice what's interesting about this group. What brings them together? These nine Jews and a Samaritan who wouldn't get together in any other scenario except in a leper colony, right? What brings them together is their illness. Their common suffering brings them together. And they begin on the road down towards the priest, towards the temple. But the problem is the Samaritan can't go to the temple. The Samaritan can't go to the temple. Why? Because his people worship on Mount Gerizim. They don't go to the temple in Jerusalem. And all of a sudden, he realizes he's cleaned just like the other ones, cleansed of his impurities. And he says, I have to go say thank you. But I'm not going to go to the priest and follow the rituals. I'm not going to go and give my offering to God and then wander back home. I'm going to go back to the source. I'm going to go find this Jesus and I'm going to say thank you. And he, he comes back and he finds Jesus and throws himself on the ground before Jesus. He says, I'm cleansed. I can, I can go back home. I'm whole again. Thank you. And Jesus looks at him and he says, why, why are you thanking me? I, I didn't heal you. Your faith in God healed you. Your faith that you believed that God would make you whole is what healed you. Go back home. But the cool thing about it is you don't have to come back to me to say thank you. You can say thank you to God wherever you are because that's the essence of the relationship that made you whole. When you go back home, how will you continue to say thank you to God? It's in your heart. And see, this was the issue in Luke's community. The, the temple had been destroyed. They couldn't go back to the temple to say thank you to God for wholeness or healing. No, they did it right where they were. And the good news for Luke's community is who's in our, who's in our healing group? Every Sunday when we gather, every Eucharist when we gather, we are healed of our separation. We are healed of that which would keep us apart. And so when we say thank you, God, we do it together here in this place, not running through certain rituals, not running to appease pastors or priests, not to give a certain amount to the church in order to have it be satisfied. You see, that's what the rabbis did. That's what the Pharisees did. No, in Luke's community, in the Christian community, we thank God here and now. Because we are the living temple. We are the place that we come back to Sunday after Sunday to say thank you. Even in the midst of our pain, even when we can't feel it ourselves, we rely on each other to say thank you, God. And that's why we come to this table week after week to say thank you, God, for the gift of your Son who calls us to wholeness who empowers us to go into the world as grateful people. Thank you for continuing to gather as God's people, to lift each other up in gratitude, to walk with each other in our leprosies, to not see each other as the foreigners that we truly are when we separate ourselves from each other. No, we are called to oneness, and that was true in Luke's community, and it is true today. Let us continue to say thank you to God.